Welcome to Heart-Based Medicine's Insights Podcast. Featuring Dr. Gavita Chinayan, cardiologist and associate professor of medicine at Oakland University and director of cardiac imaging research. What is heart-based medicine? So, I think Anne's vision is really to bring heart back into medicine. And what that is, is our current healthcare system is based so much on process and data that somewhere along the way, we have kind of become disconnected from what brought us to medicine in the first place, which is this longing for compassion, this longing for vulnerability and to connect with people in this, you know, to connect with I want to say patience, but connect on a level that is not ordinarily possible otherwise. Because when you are talking about connecting with somebody who is sick or ill, there is a, there is a loss of the usual walls that keep us, you know, feeling like we are invincible. And suddenly, we be, illness makes us vulnerable, right? And to want to connect at that level, right? And for physicians and healthcare providers to want to connect at that level takes a certain level of vulnerability on our own part, right? That is what really we want to do. We want to connect, you know, at a, at a point where there are no walls that keep our, you know, our uh, persona intact, you know, where we are showing a particular part of ourselves to the world. I'm, I'm, you know, this, I'm strong, I am, you know, I'm a particular way. And when disease takes that away, disease takes that away both from the patient and the provider. And that is the level at which we long to connect as providers, as healthcare providers, as physicians. But over time, what has happened is that that aspect of medicine has been diminished and is systematically diminished with all the processes and the, the model of healthcare, which has become more like a business. And we simply have been rendered um, invulnerable. You know, we just have been taken, that kind of privilege of wanting to connect has been taken away. We have retreated behind the mask. I love that. And so we have now, you know, instead of connecting at that level where there are no masks between the patient and me, I am required to put on a mask and not connect at emotional, spiritual, and psychological and these deeper levels. Instead, I'm providing a service under this new business model. And, but that's not what, is, what brought us to medicine in the first place, right? Because it's our inherent drive that makes us go through years of training and this, you know, almost um, this uh, self you know, deprecating kind of a life where we are, we make immense sacrifices to train in medicine because we want that. And, and yet we are not able to do that. And that creates a huge internal conflict and a rift, which, which results in this depression and it can't deal with this because this is not what I wanted. What was your breakthrough moment? You know, it happened very early in my career, right after my training, and that had to do with my own spiritual practice and which I, which had really, I had come to a turning point within my own practice and it was just revelatory that that's, the current model is not how I wanted to live, not how I wanted to serve, not how I wanted to practice medicine. So it changed right away, right after training, where um, I felt like a huge 
piece was missing from my training, where I wasn't really taught how to connect because that's something I kind of fell into through my spiritual practice. And accidentally, I should say, because it's not really taught in our training. And, and then it was, I could no longer follow the traditional model. So uh, I was very fortunate that I had, uh, you know, an, a parallel life where I was very deeply, in, you know, very deeply into spiritual practice and meditation and contemplative practices and ancient teachings and so on. So I was very fortunate that I had that, which opened me to another dimension of reality, which and, and it was no longer enough to talk to patients about their health without talking about this aspect, you know, this deeper aspect. Because then I felt like I wasn't really, it, it was a disservice when I was excluding large parts of them and only giving prescriptions and treating one little organ, the heart, rather than talking about the heart, the big heart. <laughs> What are the challenges to a heart-based medicine approach? Yes, there have been challenges for sure, um, but I also have a very supportive uh, department that um, kind of has allowed me to build my practice the way I want to, and to a certain extent. And so I've been able to do those things kind of simultaneously and uh, teach lifestyle changes and teach, um, you know, this, this issue of dharma and how to become aligned with one's own purpose and how that creates a rift that then shows up in the body, you know. And so all of these things have been an ongoing experiment for me. What advice would you give to other medical practitioners? You know, I think it's really important to get more and more people into this kind of thinking. Right. And it and I don't know if I don't think the the administrators of healthcare systems are there yet. Some are, most aren't. But the physicians who are on the verge of burnout, who are recognizing this internal conflict within themselves, they are ready. I think, you know, I'm a huge proponent of meditation because meditation really has changed my life and the lives of everybody that I teach. Um, and, and I have a meditation program. It's freely available online. It's, uh, you know, I created it for patients, but then, you know, people from all over the world enroll in it and, and practice it. And, uh, but you know, what we also need is to bring this into mainstream medical literature. That's what needs to happen. We need to bring, you know, people together from heart-based medicine to write papers, to write white papers, to write review articles, to write, you know, and publish. That's when we get noticed. It is through publications. It is through, and then once you have publications, you start getting invited to the mainstream conferences to speak. And then you speak, you, you talk about things there, right? So for the first time ever in July, I was invited to talk about stress in cardiovascular disease. Something that no, it, everybody knows, it's, it's a huge um, causative factor for cardiovascular disease, and yet there's no talk about it. And for the first time, I was invited to speak, and it really, um, opened up communication among the physicians who attended. To, and it's not that my talk was special, but the more we bring this into mainstream medicine, that's when changes happen. We can't live in isolation and then have our little conference and then we all go off and do our own thing, right? That needs to disseminate into mainstream medicine where it becomes a movement. <laughs> I love that. So you really are saying it's a call to arms, aren't you? It is. It is a call to arms. You want change? Be the change. How can we affect change in the medical system? I think, I think one thing that will really help is to engage more and more mainstream physicians. 
you know, have them come to this. See, look that there is another dimension, that we don't have to be doing things in that way, that it can be done in another way. And if we begin to do that as a group of physicians, then we start affecting change. We can't sit around waiting for administrators to do their thing. That's not it. We need to start with ourselves, right? And, and, that, and that's what we need to do. We need to bring more mainstream physicians, you know, perhaps invite them as speakers, have them look at other speakers, have them sit through other talks, look and look at the possibilities that are beyond just evidence base in medicine. You know, there's a large portion. And I think it, it, would, be, it would be challenging, but it's not as challenging as we think because the fundamental drive is there in each of us to connect. I think creating community is the key, right? And a community that's ever growing and where we have you know, physicians recruiting other physicians to become part of the community and, and really provide the tools. Provide the tools with, with particular, you know, perhaps a curriculum, perhaps a different way of looking at things, perhaps engaging them in the dialogue. What is it that you feel you are lacking, right, in your practice? How would you feel supported? Right? And what can we do to support your growth into heart-based practice, right? Heart-based medicine practice. How, what would you want beyond the systems, right? And, and if people say, well, I don't want uh, uh, electronic medical records. I want my hospital to change this and that. That's different. We will get there. But let's start here, right? What do you need to do in your little practice or in your small group of physicians, how would you change? And if we get physicians, more and more physicians from these small groups, from these big groups, to go back, take this knowledge, apply that within their clinical practice, if there's enough momentum, the system has to change, right? The system changes with momentum. The system is not going to change because we think it should. It changes because we demand it. And we can't demand it unless we put things into practice. To what degree does gender bias affect a heart-based medical approach? There is, you know, medicine, the culture of medicine is inherently misogynistic. The, and it's not just in my field, it's in every field. Because the culture of medicine, and you know, as I was saying in my talk, the culture of medicine is always a reflection of the prevailing, the prevailing culture. Because physicians don't come to medicine and start being one way. They bring their learning, you know, from their family, from their upbringing, from society, into medicine, right? And so just like the, general, the overall the culture is misogynistic, medicine is misogynistic. And um, the language we use, the, the, even the language we have for very, things that seem very innocuous, you know, very, it seemed very benign. There is inherent misogyny there. You know, for instance, we say fellowship, right? So everything, we don't even have a language other than a language that serves the male, right? So it's, it's inherent, in, in, inherent and all pervasive. And, and yet, what we are seeing is medicine needs this other perspective, the feminine perspective of inclusivity, of sweetness and compassion and love, because we have done the other long enough in an imbalanced fashion. You know, we have gone ahead with this individualistic me, me, me kind of a thing, and now we need to step back from that. And the more we, you know, include women, the more we include, and I shouldn't say all women, because women are also misogynistic. Because it's the culture, right? And it's unconscious. 
and we are raised in patriarchy and we become like that, right? So we need more and more self-aware women to come in and to take charge and say things need to change here. So things are slowly beginning to change in medicine. We have more women on editorial boards, not, not nearly enough, but slowly more women on, uh, you know, as chair of department, it's dismal right now. Leadership positions in medicine are mostly male. And so it's that, that culture is very, very, very gradually beginning to change but that's what needs to happen. What advice would you give to other female medical practitioners? What I would say is, you know, recognize your own worth first. Recognize how you may be contributing to patriarchy and misogyny. Because as soon as we become aware that that pattern stops, we need to become aware of how we are propagating this and, and and how we can change that, you know? And it's through cultivating an open heart ourselves, right? Because if women are competing against each other, we will get nowhere. We need to be all inclusive and more and more collaborative. And that's when big things can happen, big changes can happen. So it's really, and I am a huge believer in change yourself before you try to change somebody else. It, because it doesn't work. You can only ever work on yourself, right? And that's what I, I would say is, is to, you know, that sisterhood is so important. You know, it's where we raise each other up, where we are continuously pushing each other to, our, to realize our own potential. It, there is a huge need for that. We need a collaborative network of women who are, okay to be vulnerable because what happens is when, when women come into medicine, we become indoctrinated into this, into this thinking that, you know, we need to be closed off. We need to be thinking with the head and not keep our hearts closed. And we become like that. And so we need a sisterhood, a circle of women who are practitioners, who are physicians, who are caring for others, where we learn together to become vulnerable, to bring the heart back into medicine. You know, um, I have to say, from having worked with men, mostly, uh, all, my, all throughout my career, that it's really not a male trait, as in not all men are like that. Uh, a lot of men are willing to be open and sweet, and they are, um, you know, inherently kind and compassionate. Not all males have fragile egos, you know? And um, so I think that's really unfair to say that about men in general. And on the other hand, there are many females that have fragile egos, right? So it's, um, I always want to make sure that I'm not generalizing. But then, you know, life shows us a way Life shows us a way when we don't want to take the clues. You know, life is always giving us clues, you know, to change our ways. And every time we don't take that clue, she gives us another one, you know, a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one until it hits us that, oh my, yeah, yeah, something needs to change here. So I don't think this particular thing can be forced on anyone. It needs to happen on, on its own and life does that. You know, either you change your way or you perish. <laughs> Can you share personal observations of heart-based medical breakthroughs? So, you know, my field, cardiology, is, um, is really a, uh, a field that is fueled by type A personalities. You know, uh, we are, I think we are, it attracts a certain you know, kind of person who is willing to do whatever, right? And I think that's what makes us really good doctors as well. But however, it comes at a cost. And in my um, long years of work and practice, I have seen colleagues 
who were, you know, these ruthless uh, go-getters become soft with life experience and from having children or grandchildren and something moving them to a point where suddenly they wake up. It's like one day they're one way and then the next day something has shifted in them because they have been they have been given this front row seat to the beauty, the, the unbelievable beauty of life. And, or it can be a patient interaction, something that moves them permanently. And I have seen this again and again throughout my career where you know, people that I thought would never change have changed. And this is not just my colleagues, but even patients, you know, where I have I felt like, okay, this is as far as this person is going to go. And then they come back three months later and they are different. And so it's so humbling, so humbling and because of its unpredictability, that because, because life always does what she's going to do. You know, when you are talking to somebody and I have seen this, and I think I have some explanations for it. Um, when you are talking to somebody, and everybody experiences this, in certain interactions, there is a immediate or there is a gradual coherence where what you're saying and what I'm saying, what I'm saying and what you're listening to, it becomes part of one, you know? the otherness of the other person goes away. And in those moments, you know, I can notice that our breaths are synced up. And when I look, when I check heartbeats, they're the same. It has happened many times. And that is when I know that whatever I'm going to recommend, it's going to be done. It's not just trust. It's it's that connection I was talking about earlier, where you have become one. You have become one at a very deep level where there is not just trust, there is, there is mutual trust, of course, but it's more than that. It's like you have, the, the walls between us have dissolved where even our breaths and our heartbeats have synced up. And, and, you know, there have been studies looking at this coherence, the, the, the electromagnetic waves from our bodies, they just kind of merge and become, start to act as if they're one, right? And we notice this in intimate relationships, but that is possible also in a doctor-patient relationship. And it's not special to me. I know many physicians feel this. It's just that they, are not, they may not be aware of what is happening why it is that certain times you connect with a patient at such a deep level that whatever you're saying, whatever they're saying, they have, it has, you know, you have, it's all, you know, kind of merging into the lack of a problem. That's what it is. So when, when that is happening and I tell a patient, listen, you need to change your diet. I know without a doubt they will. But there, when there is no coherence, when that's not happening, they will require many, many, many reminders. I mean, this is one big deal, right? Coherence is a big deal. It's, it's, it is, it is, because, and, and they feel it. You know, I've had, I've had patients tell me, I don't know what happened the last time I talked to you. Something happened to me. And it's not me. It has nothing to do with me. It's just that we both were aware that something was going on that day that was beyond what is ordinary or human, that cannot be explained by studies, by anything. It's mystical. And those mystical things are really commonplace. You know, when you work on yourself and you become more and more aware of this interconnectedness, between yourself and everybody, that just happens all the time. It happens all the time. You know, you're just constantly aware that you're connecting with somebody 
at a deep level where you know our interaction becomes sacred every interaction is sacred of course but we are aware of that 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 sanctity and the beauty and the the sweetness and the absolute un, mind blowing um, you know the mind blowing awesomeness of of being in connection with another human being this has been heart based medicine production thanks for listening